Episode 55 Starlight, star bright, I wish I saw your light tonight. These clouds that darken and winds that bite, <laughs> cuddle up warm and tight. Greetings and welcome in to the Patuxet General. I am your host, Jess. In this season, many of us are trying to get back on track nutritionally or are simply bored with the autumn flavors. Perhaps you are ready for a change. Well, I've got you with a fancy January healthy but not too healthy lunch. With, of course, a wine pairing, which you are going to need to brace yourself to hear more chilling Block Island folklore stories. Are you in? Excellent. But first, we have to thank our Patreon subscribers. These stellar folk are the constellations Orion, Perseus, Gemini, and Taurus, as well as the waning gibbous moon that is the night sky that we call the Patuxet General, without whom we would be in darkness. So thank you! If you would like to become one of these illuminated people, look for our page on Patreon.com or simply follow the links in the show notes. But until then, let's make our fancy January healthy but not too healthy dinner. Here we are at the beginning of the year, a great time to treat your stomach to a flavor boost without guilt that seems to be built into January. What we have here is a lovely, comforting lunch-slash-dinner combo. First, a comforting zucchini and tomato soup. Then, a Boston and Radicchio salad with apples and walnut blue cheese dressing. And, a lovely wine biscuit to dip into your coffee or wine. These three recipes come from the Rhode Island Sampler with recipes from Southern New England restaurants. Today's soup recipe is from Blake's. For this recipe, you will need a medium-sized pot, one tablespoon olive oil, one red onion, diced, two cloves garlic, crushed, one half teaspoon thyme leaves, one quarter teaspoon white pepper, two medium zucchini, sliced, five cups chicken broth, heated, salt and pepper to taste, two ripe tomatoes, diced small. Saute the onion and herbs in oil. Add the zucchini and saute briefly. Add hot chicken broth and cook only until zucchini is barely done. Strain the soup, reserving the liquid. Puree the vegetables in a blender or food processor and then add back to the stock. Heat to a simmer, season to taste. Add tomatoes just before serving. Note, do not overcook this bright green soup or it will turn brown. If you make it ahead of time, cool the soup before pureeing. And then, ready to serve, bring it up to a simmer, add tomatoes, and check seasoning. The yield for the soup is six servings. Next is this simple salad, but full of flavor and a great color pairing for the soup. This recipe is from the Black Pearl Bannister's Wharf, Newport, Rhode Island. It is sweet, bitter, creamy, and fresh all at the same time, so check it out. Boston and Radicchio salad with apples and walnut blue cheese dressing. For this recipe, you will need two heads radicchio, cleaned and dried, separated into large leaves. Two heads Boston lettuce, cleaned and dried and separated into large leaves. Two Granny Smith apples, one cup toasted walnuts. And for the dressing, two cups blue cheese, Roquefort or Danish blue, two chopped shallots, one clove garlic chopped, two cups sour cream, third of a cup red wine vinegar, one and a half cups salad oil, salt and white pepper to taste, and one teaspoon of oregano. Arrange the salad either individually or on a large platter or bowl. Radicchio leaves first, then Boston leaves, so that the radicchio outlines the Boston. Cut chunks of apple unpeeled on top of the Boston, then toasted walnuts. We recommend our creamy blue cheese dressing. This yields about six servings. For the dressing, mash blue cheese with shallots, garlic, and sour cream. Incorporate vinegar and then oil gradually. Season to taste. A note, blue cheese can be salty, so be careful. You may want to add more cheese for a chunkier dressing. Now, how about a crunchy something to finish out the dish? I've got wine biscuits from Evelyn Medeiros. I have a few tips to add before we start. A uh, weak old wine is best, so use your leftovers. Be careful not to overwork the dough. Start rolling as soon as the dough is combined and... After baked, store in a cool, dry place for up to three weeks. Let's get going. For this recipe, you will need 
One cup oil, one cup red wine, she uses burgundy, one cup sugar, three tablespoons baking powder, four to five cups of flour, and one egg yolk, slightly whipped. Mix all the ingredients but the egg yolk together in a large bowl. Knead adding flour until the dough can be rolled into a ball without sticking to your fingers. Take a little piece of the dough, about the size of a walnut, and roll it until it's about the size of your finger. Form the roll into a donut shape and place on a cookie sheet. Brush with the egg yolk and bake at 375 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 minutes. Make sure you cool them and enjoy! After such light fare, you might like a little earthy something to follow up, perhaps a red grape wine. Here in Rhode Island, we are lucky enough to have a wide variety of vineyards. At visitrhodeisland.com, they have a long list that you can even book tours and tastings right there on the site. Here are the first 15. Anchor and Hope, Carolyn's Sakanaset Vineyards, Diamond Hill Vineyards, Gooseneck Vineyards, Greenvale Vineyard, Hollow Ridge Vineyards, Langworthy Farm Winery, Leyden Farm Vineyard and Winery, Mulberry Vineyards, Newport Vineyards, Nickel Creek Vineyard, Shepherd's Run, Tapped Apple Cidery and Winery, Verde Vineyards, and Winter Hawk Vineyards. Since the mid-1980s, Diamond Hill Vineyard at 3145 Diamond Hill Road, Cumberland, Rhode Island, have been tenderly taking care of their vines. At the moment, they're carrying Scarlet Run, Revelry Mulled Red, Cranberry Apple, Blueberry, Spiced Apple, Blush Raspberry Apple, and Crush Berry. Not only do they carry grape, but also fruit wines. They are made in very small, very closely monitored batches, which definitely shows in the quality. Just the thing you need to settle in with, with your biscuit, and listen to a pirate folklore story from Supernatural Folklore of Rhode Island by Edola Jean Burghese from the University of Rhode Island, 1956. I want to tell you about my friend Mike and his electromagnetic pinball museum and restoration arcade. It's an all-inclusive place to relax and share anything related to modern pinball, EM pinball, and arcade games. A group of pinball and arcade fans with an addiction to games of all kinds and Lego too. $10 gets you free play on pinball and arcade games all day. You can find them at 881 Main Street, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, or online at www.electromagneticpinballmuseum.com. Another Block Island legend tells of ghosts of the Old Harbor Landing. They have called for help on many a stormy night. Refugees, desperados, who have deserted from both armies during the revolution and devoted themselves to plunder, would sometimes invade the island. They often rowed light boats, known as shaving mills, because they tossed like shavings upon the wave and were capable of eluding the swiftest sails. A galley with nine oarsmen with such a boat came to the island in a rough sea for plunder. It approached the old harbor point landing, where the water has always been deep and the rocks dangerous. The surf was dashing fearfully, and the galley of refugees attempted to land, but were swamped and all drowned in the evening. It is said that while they were straining every muscle upon their oars, the islanders on the beach heard a powerful voice among them saying, Pull, boys! Pull for your lives! Followed by the cries, Help! Help! For many years afterwards, persons in the vicinity claimed to have heard the command at night when no boatmen were there, and within the memory of the living scores of men at the time have thus been deceived and hence originated the Harbor Boys. The frightful calls of the Harbor Boys died away about the time of the Palatine Ship of Fire sailed off to return no more to Block Island. The excitement found in the tales of the Palatine and the Harbor Boys is matched with still another Block Island tale about a buccaneer, a Spanish lady, and a snow-white steed. Lee, a Block Island fisherman and wrecker, turned buccaneer and outfitted a vessel with guns and an evil crew. In a Spanish port, he agreed to take on a passenger, a beautiful widow, her servants, and her white horse. Once at sea, he killed the servants and went down to get the lady. She eluded him and threw herself overboard. In a rage, he ordered that the white horse be thrown overboard too. 
The horse tried to swim after the ship, but finally, with a great cry, the animal sank. After many adventures, when the fame of Lee's ship was widespread, Lee brought the ship to Block Island, removed everything of value, and set her adrift. The captain and a few chosen associates lived like kings on their stolen wealth. But one night, something like a burning vessel was seen approaching the rocky shore. As the wreck came toward that bold coast, Lee saw with horror that the waves were covered with the bodies of those who had been his victims. Among them, the form of the beautiful widow, whose veil floated like a pall upon the blood-red waters. In advance of all swam a white horse that sprang upon the shore and made directly for the terror-stricken pirate. Controlled by some destiny against which he was powerless, he mounted the spectral deed and was borne away. Some say that he was taken to the sea and drowned. Others say that he's still riding. But so much for Block Island seafaring legends. And while the island lore has a better quality than the mainland sea tales, the latter has an edge on quantity. There has just been one ghost ship recorded sailing up Narragansett Bay. Under a full August moon, Ben Gladding was clam digging in the cove on the end of Connecticut, just above Beavertail, when he straightened up to rest and saw a strange vessel, unlike any craft he had ever beheld, having a high stern, cross yards upon her bowsprit, and sails curiously fashioned came rapidly towards him. The oddest thing about this particular vessel was not her appearance, although that was odd enough, but the fact that she seemed to have come over a shoal where no vessel could have come and was sailing swiftly right in the eye of what wind there was, with her yards square and her sails wrapped full. She passed within a biscuit toss of Ben, heading for the shore, a little to the south of him, where she crossed the land as easily as she had traversed the water. And the last thing he saw of her was heading for Graves Point. Ben afterwards swore that she had no lights, but in the moonshine, he could clearly see the flag that flew from her mainmast, spread out by that same mysterious wind that filled her sails. And that flag was adorned with a skull and crossbones. Sea tales are filled with such nocturnal voyages as this by Captain Kidd or some other pirate, but old Ben Gladding was the only Rhode Islander to see one, or at least to have written his story down. Along with pirates goes buried treasure, and there are various spots along the coast where pirate gold was believed to have been buried at one time or another. But none of these places have supernatural tales surrounding them, unless you consider the general superstitions and mystic protections given to all buried treasure. Stolen valuables were always buried geometrically, and broken swords were often buried on tops of the chest. Further safeguards could be human blood and bones, and there were tales of Captain Kidd having a pirate killed to bury with the chest to protect it. Perhaps all this hocus-pocus explains why so few of the Seekers have success, and why perfect darkness and profound silence are the conditions of success. Two Rhode Island tales, both from Westerly, reveal the unhappy coincidences awaiting treasure seekers who speak while digging for treasure. A dying man confessed that he had stolen some treasure from a British ship and buried it north of the village of Westerly. The agent sent to search for the treasure failed to find the spot, but rumor brought a lot of prospectors, including Elias Crandall, who found the correct place. He and his friends started digging. After several hours, they touched a trunk or box, apparently covered with bear skin. In their surprise and extreme joy, one of the company, unlearned in the respect of necessary silence to be observed in all such enterprises, thoughtlessly exclaimed, We have found it! We have found it! and the day was lost. The treasure, almost in their hands, vanished from sight, and all subsequent digging had been in vain. In a similar situation, people who lived in Lamphere Hollow became convinced that money had been buried in the orchard. They sent for Charles Green to come with his mercurial, or witch-hazel rod, to point out the treasure. The site was selected, and... After digging some three feet near the foot of an apple tree, they struck something hard. Surely fortune had smiled upon them. Hope was on tiptoe. In the greatness of their joy, not doubting success, one of their party spoke. Alas, the mystic power was broken. The box apparently rolled off with a rumbling noise and was lost forever. Fortune is fickle to fools whose tongues are untied. The remaining sea tales do not fall into any one category. Each of the four is separate in theme from the others. 
Captain Jimmy Hammond saw a vision and heard a deep voice as he stood on the shores of Fox Island. He was told to mend his ways, and Captain Hammond became a changed man. Continuing to have visions and hear voices, he was told in later communications that Rhody Baker would be his wife, and although he had never given the lady any serious attention before this, the captain spent the rest of his life courting Rhody Baker. However, his voices had misinformed him, for she never consented to be his wife. Thank you once again for joining us at the PG. If you would like to reach out with a question, comment, info about our general store, or dare I say a local ghost story, our email is jess at patuxetgeneral.com. Please reach out. We would love to hear from you. But until then, I'll meet you right back here next time at the Patuxet General. A Something for Posterity production. Pre-recorded in Patuxet. <laughs>